How did Solomon ruin his life? This is the third hour of our study in the book of Proverbs. And what I'd like to read to you is a verse. And you can see here on the board, class three, how did Solomon ruin his life? We're focusing on Proverbs 12, 26. And this is, again, one of the key themes. There are 10 themes that we're working through of the probably 140 some scholars have found in the book of Proverbs, but about 70% of the book covers these 10 themes. And we've seen in class one uh, that true wisdom is salvation. We saw last hour that to do the will of God, to be servant-hearted is the only way to have a life that, that never ends and the only way to have a life that doesn't get burnt up. But this class, we're looking at being not saved, not servant-hearted, but being selective in our friends. Now, look at this. How did Solomon, what's the asterisk? The smartest, the richest, uh, the most humanly blessed man on earth that's ever lived, other than our Lord Jesus Christ. How did he ruin his life? Right here, Proverbs 12, 26. The righteous, whoa, the righteous are those who are saved, who have wisdom from above, who are living for eternal gain. They're going God's way. They are no longer going the way they were born. They are not lost. They're not living in foolishness. They're not losing everything, which is man's way. Verse 26, the righteous, the saved, the wise, should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. Look at the answer. How did Solomon ruin his life? Proverbs 12, 26, introducing that huge theme of being selective in our friends. He didn't select his friends God's way. God says, verse 26, choose your friends carefully. What does that mean? <laughs> Proverbs is a guide. It says, these are the, the foolish, and don't, don't befriend them. Don't go their way. As the psalmist said, don't walk or stand or sit with the ungodly and, and emulate their lifestyle. But really, how Solomon ruined his life is because he didn't heed God's path of wisdom. He knew the Lord, but he had many foolish decisions that he made in his life. Well, back at the slides, how did Solomon ruin his life? This is just the third lesson of our living life God's way as we're exploring the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs has 10 main themes we're going to be looking at. We're on that third one. Next time, we'll look at being submissive to God, which is humility and, and how that uh, reveals the ultimate sin of pride. And on, you can go through that list of the topics. But what God says is, be selective in your friendships. Now, on the slide, uh, make sure you note uh, somewhere if you're taking notes, these three verses, and then we're going to go through them in the scriptures together. Proverbs 12, 26, James 4, 4, and 1 Kings 11, 4. So I've already read Proverbs 12, 26. The righteous should choose his friends carefully. Now, let me say to you, all of us who are saved, God has something clear to say about the friends we choose. The first thing he has to say is right here in James 4 and verse 4. James 4.4, 4, remember James, uh, most likely the very first New Testament book that was written. James tells us in chapter 4 and verse 4, adulteresses and adulteress, adulterers and adulteresses. Now listen, do you not know that Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Pause. Think about that. When we befriend the world, it causes enmity with God. That means we treat God with hostility, like we're his enemy. And worse than that, God acts hostile toward us. You know what the scriptures say? He resists us. He, he no longer blesses us because we are acting, what? Like an unsaved person.
See, when a Christian sins, when they're the saved who have God's wisdom living for him, sin, they are acting like a lost person. It's foolish. Do you know what usually happens? As a pastor for four decades, when I meet people that come to my office and say, I just, I don't think I'm a Christian. I say, well, did you ever think you were a Christian? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, I said, the good news is if you were ever a Christian, you're still a Christian because you can't unchristian yourself, okay? But let's do a little diagnostic to see if maybe you're making foolish decisions and you're acting like a lost person and you've lost the joy of your salvation. The Holy Spirit is grieved. Now back to James 4.4, he explains it. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Remember 1 John chapter 2, 15 to 17? Love not the world, nor the things in the world. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lusts are of. But he that doeth the will of God, he that doeth the will of God, abides forever. God says, be selective in your friendship. What happened to Solomon? Let's go to 1 Kings and make sure you tie this in in your notes. 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 14. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives... Did you know that the person you marry should be your best friend? That's one of the ways you know who you're supposed to marry. You find someone who you completely share life with, you share emotions with them, your spiritual life with them, your physical life with them, everything that is important to you, you share with them, but beware of who you befriend. Remember, verse four, his best friends, his wives, turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. Verse 5, Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, and Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord. And by the way, how did he do that? It's because he began to follow his friends, his best friends, his wives, to worship their gods. If you go to Jerusalem today and, and, and stand there on the, the Mount of Olives overlooking the old city Jerusalem, every guide will say, as you're looking at Jerusalem right over there on the left, that's the hill of offense. And all the tourists stand there and say, hmm, like they, you know, don't even know what it is, but are embarrassed to ask. And someone will finally say, what's the hill of offense? And the guide always says, that's where Solomon built the homes for his wives because they were not Jews, they were not believers, and they worshiped false gods, so he let them live on that hill with all their false gods and their idols, which they brought into Israel, into God's people. Well, let's talk about Solomon. The next slide, Solomon towers over most who've ever lived. What did the scriptures say about Solomon? Let's just look at some more scriptures. Proverbs 1.1. 1, 1. In your Bibles, and let me get there, it says in Proverbs, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, 1.1, 1, 1. this book, first verse, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Now look at Proverbs chapter 10, verse 1. The Proverbs, let me get to 10.1, of Solomon, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a grief of his mother. Keep going to chapter 25, Proverbs chapter 25. Look what it says there. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. Now remember, we already have talked about that, that Solomon did the vast majority of the Proverbs, 513 of them in this book. But also there are Proverbs of the wise men, King Lemuel, and on and on of others that are a part of it. In this section are the Proverbs that Solomon gave under the inspiration of God's Spirit that Hezekiah collected. But here's some other verses, and I want to read those to you. 1 Kings 3, 12. Behold, I have done, this is the Lord speaking, according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart. Now, this is why Solomon towers over all other kings that have ever lived. Listen to what God said. So that there has not been anyone like you before you, 
nor shall any like you arise after you. What does that mean? Solomon understood everything. God gave him this understanding. It says he understood animals, and he understood plants, and he understood all the, the things of the world. Plus, he spoke with divine wisdom. But keep going. Look at 1 Kings 4.32. He spoke 3,000 Proverbs. How many are in the book of Proverbs? 513. But he spoke 3,000. And above that, verse 32 says, he, his songs were 1,005. So he actually excelled his father David, most likely, because David only wrote half the Psalms, songs. So Solomon wrote 1,005 songs or Psalms. Now, two of them were inspired, and we have those in the book of Psalms. But he wrote many more. It's kind of like this. Some people have trouble with that. They say, wait a minute, how can Solomon write Proverbs that aren't in the Bible? How can he have Psalms that aren't in the Bible? Are we missing part of the Bible? No. No. Did you know David lived a normal life, had correspondence with, with many people, but only the Psalms that God inspired and only the words that God inspired were put in the Bible. The same with the Apostle Paul. Apostle, the Apostle Paul wrote many letters. He talks about them but only those that were inspired by the Spirit of God make their way into the Bible. One last verse about Solomon, 1 Kings 10 and verses 23 and 24. So King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. And it doesn't stop there. Verse 24 says, All the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom. Listen which God put in his heart. Solomon was a testament to the greatness of God, and, and the world came to hear him. That's why I say in your next slide there, God gives us a context for the book of Proverbs. Think of sitting behind these books and seeing what was going on in the book of Proverbs. Now remember, Solomon wrote three books. He wrote the Song of Solomon probably when he was young. Oh, now, if I was teaching the Song of Solomon, what a beautiful story. The thumbnail is this. Solomon, in all of his wealth, had bought many farms and vineyards. He had a vineyard that was very special. And one day, he went to his vineyard undercover. He didn't wear his king outfit. He didn't ride up in his chariot. He just walked over there and actually started working. Now, he owned it, and the owner knew the vineyard, and his manager knew he was Solomon, but the workers didn't know him because they didn't have Facebook, they didn't have the internet, they couldn't look up his picture. And so a normal Solomon walks in as a worker, the manager didn't give him away, and he's across the vineyard working from a, this young lady he was interested in. And they work together trimming and tying the vines and getting to know each other, and they fall in love, and she commits her heart to him to marry him. They get engaged, and then when she comes to see him just before their wedding, he's gone. And the whole Song of Solomon is this lament, and she's saying, oh no, he's gone, I don't know what to do, my heart is broken, and all this. And then it ends in the last chapter of Song of Solomon with this chariot coming. And the manager says, the king is coming. And all the workers line up and they bow before the king. And the king gets off his chariot and his armor wearing all of his finery. And he walks right over to the workers and stands right in front of her. And she's looking down. And the king says, hello. And she jerks her head up and looks at him, and she said, it's you. That's what Song of Solomon is about. It's about a theology of love, what marital love should be like, and spiritually, what our engagement to Christ should be like and how much we should love him. From the peak of his life, Solomon wrote Proverbs. From the end of his life, he wrote Ecclesiastes. But what we're sure about the backdrop for Proverbs is the vast reputation that Solomon had for wealth and wisdom. So he can speak on this topic because God inspired him. His fleet of boats were known to ports all over the world. The scriptures tell us that, that his boats regularly came in bringing gold and precious wood and, and animals from tropical places that were exotic. 
and also his commercial enterprises brought the goods of the world on caravans to his doorstep. The next slide. Solomon's three books have risen from the three stages of his life. God inspired the Song of Solomon from the young man in love. God inspired Proverbs from the wisdom of a mature man at his zenith. And God inspired Ecclesiastes from an old and bitter man looking back on his wasted opportunities. And why was, was he old and bitter? Because he didn't select his friends God's way. He ruined his life and he neglected to heed God's path of wisdom. The next slide reminds us the wisdom that God, uh, that God offers that Solomon neglected to obey was at a crucial time. Now, look in your Bibles and let me explain this to you. 1 Kings chapter 1. 1 Kings chapter 1. Now, remember, the only way to properly interpret any book of the Bible is to understand the context, the historical context. And the context is contained in who God was sending that message to, the original recipients. Do you remember we covered that in class one? Well, Proverbs were sent to the recipient, Solomon, at this time in his life when he was, look at chapter 1 and verse 38. It says, So Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada and the Carathites and the Pelathites went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule. They took him to Gihon and, King, and then Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the tabernacle and anointed Solomon. And they blew the horn, and all the people said, Long live what? King Solomon. The wisdom God offered Solomon was neglected when he became king. Why? What, what was Solomon supposed to do? Well, on the slide there, God had given him a road to lifelong usefulness. Now, let, let me explain to you real, quick, real quickly what that means. We're going to see in Deuteronomy 17. So take your Bibles, and I want to show you what Solomon was supposed to do on that day he was anointed to be king. He was supposed to start something. Deuteronomy 17, and starting in verse 18, says, And it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom. Who, who are we talking about? The king. Back up to uh, uh, verse 14. Uh, of Deuteronomy 17. When you come in the land which the Lord gives you and you dwell in it, verse 15, you shall surely set a king over you. So Solomon was set over as a king. Verse 15 says, don't set him as a foreigner. Verse 16, he, the king, should not multiply horses. Hmm. 17, he shall not multiply wives. Hmm. Lest he turn his heart away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold. Hmm. How is Solomon supposed to know all these things? Well, here's the pathway to God's usefulness. Look at verse 18. And it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests and the Levites, and it, that's his copy he makes, shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and carefully observe, whoa, how did Solomon ruin his life? Well, one big obvious element is he didn't select friends God's way. But why didn't he select friends God's way? Because he didn't heed God's path of wisdom. What's God's path of wisdom? Well, he had an assignment here. L let me just go through this assignment. Look at the next slide and I'll read it and you just follow along. A skilled scribe who was at his peak could copy the words of a page in two to three hours if everything was set for him. Now, I'm talking about in the time of Solomon. If he had ink and paper and pen and a reader to read it to him, he would copy it down. Now, back to your Bibles. What does it say in verse 18? When he sits on the throne, he shall write a copy of this law. What law is he talking about? He's talking about the Pentateuch. He's talking about the first five books of the, of the Bible. Now, for a moment, take in your hands your Bible and get Genesis to Deuteronomy. Right there. See, here's the Bible. 
and look at that much. You see, in my Bible, it's 194 pages of the 1100. So it's 200 pages of 1,000. It's a fifth, almost, of the Bible. Now look back at the slide. The Pentateuch has 5,852 verses, nearly 160,000 words. At normal speed, it would take a minimum of 900 hours to hand copy the Hebrew letters with ink and a quill onto an animal skin or parchment. That would be six months of work, nonstop, at eight hours a day. Look at the next slide. 192 pages, that's the Pentateuch, 5,852 verses, 160,000 words, 900 hours of work, or six months of eight-hour days. Now look up from your slides. God asked every king of Israel to do something as soon as they sat down on the throne. He asked them to do something very hard. He asked them to devote themselves to hand copying 192 pages of the Bible and having that personal copy sitting next to them in the throne. Now, look at the next slide. Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 17, before this command to copy, would have been something Solomon would have had to have copied over. And it says, when you're king, don't multiply horses, don't multiply wives, don't multiply gold and silver. Uh, let me just ask you, even uh, someone that has a very cursory knowledge of Solomon's life, what was he known for? He was known for having chariot cities, thousands of horses. He was known for having a thousand wives. How many wives do most people have? Either zero or one. The majority of people throughout all history have either not been married or had one. The vast majority. Solomon had a thousand. And gold and silver? He had more gold than anyone has ever amassed in history. And silver was as common as gravel, it says, during his reign. Wow. He would have noted that, those three direct commands of God, if he would have, look at this, if he would have heeded God's path of wisdom. What was God's path of wisdom? Well, look at the next slide. This is what the Lord said. God says, I have a pathway for you in Deuteronomy 17, 18 through 20. God's pathway, number one, that God must become your personal pursuit. Notice what it says in, in verse 18, that he shall write for himself. Wow, a copy of this law. It's, it's a personal pursuit. Number two, pursuing God would be inconvenient because it says in verse 18, from the one before the priests of the Levites. Now, just think for a minute uh, what that means. This isn't something Solomon could do in his robe and slippers. He couldn't just sit there with the fire going in his fireplace, you know, eating breakfast and, you know, sitting in bed and copying this thing. He had to get up, get ready, get dressed, and make a trip from his palace to the tent outside of town where the, the tabernacle was and where the scrolls of the Pentateuch. And the priest would have to get them out of the chest, and the priest would have to lay them on a table. They were, there was only one copy, and they were very, very special and important and revered. And he had to sit there as the priests were watching him eight hours a day, five days a week for six months, and hand copy for himself. Look back at the slides. Pursuing God will be inconvenient to your life. It was especially for Solomon. Number three, God's word must be your guarded treasure. Verse 19 says, and it shall be with him. Now look up for a second. Think about this. Did you know I was taught when I was a young person, like many of you that are, that are actually taking this course for credit in Bible institutes, I was taught by my youth pastor that this book, the Bible, should go with me when I went to school every day. Now, we didn't have 
uh, electronic devices back then. When you went to school, you had a stack of books. You had your English book and your math book and your science book and your history book and whatever other c courses you were taking. And usually, and by the way, they hadn't invented backpacks 40 years ago when I was in school. We carried everything. And, and so here's this big arm of books. And what our pastor, my youth pastor said is, the top book in your pile should be your Bible. Now look back at that slide. Where did he get that from? Deuteronomy 17, 19. And it shall be with him, the king. God wants us to guard the scriptures and have it be a part of our life. The next slide, the fourth point of God's pathway, reading the word must become your personal habit. And he shall read it. Now look up. I know that many of you that are in training are in school and you're studying the Bible. And you have to write down the chapter title of every title of the Bible and you have to do all of these different things that you're doing and you have to do readings for your Bible classes. And especially if you're in the two-year program, it's just like you're immersed in the scripture. We're not talking about during Bible school. Look back at that slide. Reading the word must become your personal habit, whether you're in school or not, and he shall read it. The next slide, number five, of God's pathway, how to pursue him and his wisdom, nurturing your soul must become a lifelong habit. It was a daily reading, but look at what verse 19 says, all the days of his life. Now pause. Let me ask you. Do you hunger for the Word of God as much as you are reminded in the morning that you want breakfast or coffee or tea? Or at lunchtime when you got up and didn't have breakfast, your stomach is growling and you're looking for something to eat? Or you're famished at dinner and the only thing on your mind is, where am I going to eat and I don't want to miss the meal? Did you know the Bible says that we're supposed to hunger after the, the pure milk of the word, until we grow enough that we feast on the meat of God's word. Number five, nurturing your soul must become a lifelong habit. Number four, it must become reading the word as a personal habit that cultivates a lifelong habit. And now look at number six, spiritual growth takes up your time. It's not instantaneous. Verse 19 says, it continues, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God. Whoa, look at this. God says, Solomon, you ruined your life because you didn't obey my word and select friends God's way because you did not commit to seeking God's path of wisdom. You didn't you didn't realize spiritual growth takes time. It's not instantaneous. It takes time to read the Bible. It takes time to mark the scriptures. It takes time to memorize the scriptures. Are you committed, lifelong, personally, to long-term growth? That's God's pathway. Oppositions him sexually. Do you remember what Joseph said? Not only did he say no, and flee. But before he fled, he looked at Potiphar's wife and he said, how can I do this evil and sin against what? God. I can, you know, I, I have a phonographic mind. In other words, when I talk to you, I'm actually seeing pictures. I was seeing Joseph right then. I was seeing, uh, you know, Solomon supposed to copy this. I, I was seeing David as he did copy it and it came out in all those Psalms he did. Do you know what I think of when I think of Potiphar's wife and Joseph's statement to her? Joseph said, how can I do this evil and sin against God? And Potiphar's wife went, God, there's nobody else in this room. There's nobody else in this house. Who are you talking about? What's the fear of God? You know God's watching all the time. Proverbs reminds us of that. That's God's path of wisdom. To, to say, Lord, I want to go your way and you're watching. You saved me, you redeemed me, you bought me at a price. You've given me your wisdom. I want to start redeeming my time for eternity. Number six, spiritual growth takes up your time, and it's not instantaneous. Number seven, God wants your obedience. 
not just going through motions. Now, what does 19, verse 19 say? And be careful to observe, look at the next word, all the words of this law and these statutes. The king copied all of those words down so he would know how God wanted him to select his friends so that he would heed God's path of wisdom. And specifically, Solomon would know that he's not supposed to multiply horses, not multiply wives, and not multiply wealth. Now you say, wait a minute. I thought Solomon inherited the biggest fortune ever passed on from his dad, David. Yeah, but what did David do with his wealth? Remember, David had done this. David had heeded God's path of wisdom. That's why he writes the 19th Psalm and talks about the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And he says, it's sweeter than honey in my mouth. I love it. I long for the word of God. He had done this exercise. He had copied his own copy. It shows up in all of his Psalms. It shows up in all of his dealings with people. David followed God's path of wisdom. Solomon didn't. He just went through, number seven in your slides, he went through the motions and was not careful to observe all the words of this law and these statues. Number eight, God expects you to choose humility. Deuteronomy 17, 20, that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren. Now, while Solomon was to do this path of wisdom, look what he would have bumped into. You see, these are the top 10 themes of the book of Proverbs. The wisdom of, of being, remember what chapter one, we, we read this, chapter one says, I'll put my spirit on you. See, that's salvation. Proverbs talks about the Holy Spirit saving people. And the king was supposed to be reminded of God's salvation, of being a servant, of having selecting the right friends. But look at this, so that he would submit to God and not be proud. Now back to number eight, God expects you to choose humility. What is humility? That your heart may not be lifted up above your brethren. God wants us not thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Number nine, God expects your submission. Deuteronomy 17, 20 says, continuing this verse, it says that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left. And what the Lord is saying is, I want you to submit to me. I want you to say, speak, Lord, your servant hears. By the way, what is servanthood? It's being willing to have someone tell you what to do. Do you know what most people say? I'm not going to have anybody tell me what to do. Most people bristle at being told, go over there, do this, wear that, come at this time, you know, whatever. We don't like rules and we don't like to be bossed around. But what did God say? Jesus said to his disciples, who's the greatest among you? The one who's the greatest what? Servant. Now, uh, let's just talk for a minute about that word servant. Because in the New Testament, the word that is translated most often servant is literally the word in English, slave. What word is that? Doulos. Now, the, the New Testament translators, when they came to the Greek word doulos, which meant slave, that's all it meant. No doubt, it's always in literature, doulos, slave. But when they were translating the Bible, slavery, just like today, was a very bad topic, controversial and looked down upon, and no one could ever think that God wanted to call us slaves. But that is what he said. And a slave is someone who is willing to do what they're told to do. A slave has no rights. A slave doesn't own anything. A slave doesn't have anything to look forward to except a lifetime of doing what someone else tells them to do. And when we got saved, God owns us. And we become his doulos, plural douloi. Servants, mm -hmm. except a servant could pick who they served. A slave 
had no choice. They just responded in obedience. Back to your uh, slides. God expects our submission. We're his slaves. And we're not supposed to turn from his commandment to the right or to the left. The final element from God's pathway in Deuteronomy 17 is God wants to bless you and offers you a spiritual heritage. Here was the promise to the king that he may prolong his days in his kingdom and he and his children in the midst of Israel. Now look up. What's God saying? God's saying, if you will heed my path of wisdom, it's going to cause you to have longevity, prosperity, success. What does Joshua 1, 8 and 9 say? This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate there in day and night, that you may prove to do what is acceptable in the Lord's sight. And then what does it say? And he will prosper you in all that you will do. Fear not, he said, I'm going to bless you in every way if this book of the law, that you follow God's path of wisdom, if you respond and submit, if you are submissive, if you have a singular focus, if you are self-controlled by the Spirit, if you see all of life as a stewardship, that it, it, you don't own it, that, that your money and time belong to God, if you're hardworking and studious, if you're sober-minded, you have a godly mind, and speak wisely, you'll show that you belong to God. Well, the next slide. There are stark contrasts that the Scripture give us between David and Solomon. Let me just give these to you. In God's Word, the Bible, two old men sat down and wrote the summary of their lives. One was a father, the other his son. Both wrote under the inspiration of God's Spirit. Both had suffered through many afflictions. Both knew the Lord in an unusual way. For one, Solomon, he looked back almost bitterly at the end of his life. And he looked back and, and he perhaps too late, realized that the only way to live and the best way to die was to reflect on God's plans in the first place. His name was Solomon. The summary of his life, a book called Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes could be called the lessons of what happens to you when you neglect a lifestyle of fearing God, as described in the book of Proverbs. Solomon found out after his restless pursuit of all the world had to offer that nothing but God satisfies. In fact, the, the message of Ecclesiastes is nothing satisfies but God. What about the other one? Well, the next slide says that David invested his life with God. The other man at the end of his life looks back and sees a lifelong growth in experiencing God. His name was David, the father of Solomon. David ended well, feared no evil because he remembered his creator. His summary was still the, the best known song in the world is. Do you know what one of David's writings everybody in Christendom knows? The 23rd Psalm. As a youth, David remembered his creator. In Acts 13, 22, 6, God wrote David's epitaph. He said, he is the man after my own heart who serves my purpose. The next slide, there's a warning for all of us. Difficult, hard, and evil days are ahead. That's what Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 12. The next slide, I remind you, we have a choice. Don't ruin your life like Solomon. Each day, we're choosing a pathway. God wants us to walk in wisdom. In the next slide, that's why I ask you, why should we memorize Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? Here's the reason why, just before we go, and our class is almost over, but Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 have some important elements. The first word is trust. And what that word means in Hebrew, if you did a word study on it, is to lie helplessly face down. So God wants us to, to come to him submissively and in humility. Trust, just fall before the Lord helplessly and humbly. Then it says, lean not on yourself. Do you know what that means? The word lean means not to incline, but actually to be held up by. If I lean against this wall far enough, I can't stand up without the wall holding me up. Do you know what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says? Only be able to go through life held up by God as we fall submissively before him. 
Then verse 6 says, in all your ways acknowledge him. That means knowing God, seeking God, pursuing his wisdom, and seeing that living for him is what life is about. And then it says God will direct your paths. Well, the last slide is a reminder. That's how Solomon ruined his life. What is that? How did the world's smartest and richest man ruin his life? He didn't select his friends God's way. Do you? Are you committed to not marrying an unbeliever? Solomon married an unbeliever and ruined his life. Are you going to heed God's path of wisdom? Let's bow and pray. Father, thank you for this third class. Thank you for the truth from your word that we can all embrace and learn from. But it must start by us humbly coming submissively before you, trusting you helplessly. Apart from your grace, we can't live this way. You gave Solomon grace, and he foolishly didn't heed your law, your word, your truth, and didn't follow your pathway. We want to. In the precious name of Jesus and for your glory, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. <music>